So, Joan, as we as we walk through geometric algebra, I think the, the best place to start might be through a more tangible example. So you're doing a project with drones here at Cambridge. Can you explain that first? Yes. So we're doing a project with drones. This is joint with the architecture department. And what we'd like to do is use drones to look at the built environment generally. And the yeah. built environment has is made up of lots of lines. So what we would like to do is to do a lot of our processing, our vision processing with lines. Mm -hmm. And lines are much more difficult classically in computer vision than points. A lot of reconstruction is done with points. You get a point cloud. You can get structure from motion. So from motion vision. capture, for instance, when you see someone in the suit with all the ping pong balls, they're connecting points. They are, they are all points, exactly. Yeah. But then even, no, not with motion capture, just with cameras that right. are moving, you can get points, you can match points. Okay. So we would like to do this with lines. Lines are difficult and our mathematical framework that we will use for this is geometric algebra. Okay. So let's define it. <laughs> let's start there. Yeah. <laughs> Me. Shall yeah. I define it? Yes. Okay. Um, and we'll see if it ties in with see if it makes sense. what you've read <laughs> about it. So um, do you want some history? Yeah, let's start. So, um, so Grassmann was a mathematician and Grassmann had something called an outer product. So for example, I can take two vectors. Mm -hmm. I can ha put a wedge between them, a mm -hmm. wedge product or an outer product, and I get A wedge B. Mm -hmm. So this quantity is now a different thing. And I'll explain what that yeah. is. So Grassman had this outer product. And Clifford, William Clifford, who was actually at Trinity <laughs> before he moved to London. Yeah. Um, so he came along and he extended this outer product. He effectively had um, an inner product plus an outer product. So, for example, if I have two vectors, mm -hmm. A dot B, mm -hmm. where the dot is an inner product giving me a scalar, and A wedge B, which gives me this other thing, is a Clifford product. Okay. So, seems like a strange thing to do. The, and he had an algebra for this, this Clifford product, which is called Clifford algebra, and has been in the mathematics um literature and research program forever since okay. Clifford died which was um in the 1870s he died at the age of 34 I think but um so of TB so he did a lot but clearly could have done much more right so but as a as a kind of you know applied tool um it wasn't wasn't really used mm -hmm. and it was David Hestness who came in the 1960s and said Gosh, you know, <laughs> uh, look at this. Clifford called it geometric algebra. I'm going to call it geometric algebra, and I'm going to do all these wonderful things with it. Mm -hmm. So effectively, I'll te so that's the the background. the The basis is so. Imagine I have scalars, mm -hmm. so just numbers, um, vectors, so things with a magnitude and a direction. In 3D, we can think of this. Yeah. By vectors, they're planes. Okay. Right? So things that have two vectors, that makes a plane. Yep. So a plane would have a position and a magnitude and a handedness. Yeah. What is that? A handedness is, so suppose I have three points that make up a plane. Okay. I can, I can sort of go from A to B to C mm -hmm. or from A to C to B. Got it. Okay. So if I take A wedge B to form my plane in vectors, uh -huh. then B wedge A will give me minus the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it's a you have to then start to think of these planes as as geometric objects which have a sign as well. Mm -hmm. So in so if I take vectors A, wedge B, wedge C, it gives me a volume. Again it will be an oriented volume. Mm -hmm. If I live in four dimensions, A, wedge B, wedge C, wedge D will mm -hmm. give me a four volume. Okay. So at some point, I get to the highest element in space. In 3D, that would be a volume. I can't go any bigger. And that has a special that has a special place in my algebra. So imagine I have, in 3D, scalars plus vectors plus bivectors plus trivectors. So 
points, lines, planes, volumes. I have an algebra which takes these things as objects mm -hmm. and I can add them, I can multiply them, I can differentiate with respect to them. So it's a kind of abstract concept, but it is amazingly powerful. Okay. So that's that's the the kind of rough idea of right how Clifford algebra moved to geometric algebra in yeah. the modern and and this is all predating computers. So this isn't being rendered anywhere yet. You mean in hardware? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have we have a community, not a, a massive community, but there are lots of um, people who are very interested in in uh, you know potentially getting instructions for chipsets, etc. Okay. FPGAs, it is okay. So, hmm. and of course, we have quite a lot of um, programs that people have been building so that the community can test these things out. And so what rekindled it in the 60s to make to make it happen now? Um, so David Hessners was doing his PhD and he was a, a physicist and looking at space-time. So basically his, his PhD turned into a book called Space-Time Algebra from which basically in the 80s people got hold of and started to get interested in hmm. even though david had been working on it throughout since the 60s um what started david on the clifford algebra i am actually not quite sure okay i'll ask him <laughs> yeah okay. and, and then so but, but yeah. you mean why so but the he very quickly realized that um this algebra simplified a lot of space-time physics. Right, so that's kind of what I wanted to get at. It's like, Sorry. why, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. What was the realization that made it like, why is this important now? Why is this important? So, in effect, um, um, space-time physics, um, quantum physics, relativity is extremely complicated and is, you know, it, it's the area that we're, where you do have to have a lot of background knowledge mm -hmm. and a lot of background mathematical knowledge. Mm -hmm. You do need to be proficient in, for example, for general re relativity, you need differential geometry. You need a lot of these mathematical systems. You need a lot of tensor analysis. So, I mean, David could see that with this algebra, he could work entirely within an algebra of geometric objects, transformations between these objects, mm -hmm. everything stayed in the algebra. Transformations, like linear transformations, functions, um, were um, geometrically intuitive. There were mappings of objects to objects. They weren't just tensors. Um, we didn't have to go to another space, you know, a, a sort of dual space, as you do in differential geometry. So... Um, things became the easy. And hmm. he started to see that you could interpret a lot of things like Dirac matrices. Well, actually, they're not matrices at all. They were, you know, elements of the algebra. And immediately they became easy to deal with. Hmm. So his big um, motivation was that here was a unifying language for mathematics and physics basically. So if you know this language, you can not only do um, rigid body dynamics and engineering and classical mechanics, mm -hmm. you can do um, linear algebra without matrices and without tensors, and you can do complex things in um, quantum space-time physics with the same mathematical system. And this is not theorized, this is proven. At this oh, point, yeah, yeah, it all, yeah. it's all good. Oh, it's yeah, all just good. to clarify oh, yeah, for yeah, everyone. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not like this it's idea that maybe this might work someday. No, right. but the part of the problem is that we all, I mean, you, you might, you, your next question might be, well, if it's so wonderful, well, why doesn't everyone use it? Right. Okay. Um, so A, Clifford died when he was 34, and it was at the point where Gibbs, heavy side, came in and uh, produced vector algebra and the cross product. Mm -hmm. And so... Have you ever thought about the cross product? Nope. <laughs> so, so if I have two vectors and I take A cross B, it gives me 
the vector, which is perpendicular to the plane, effectively. Mm -hmm. Now, that's all very nice, but it only works in 3D. It doesn't work in any other dimension. Right? Because in a plane, right. I've so you're, got no you're perpendicular. Stuck. Right. You're stuck. In okay. four dimensions, there's no concept of a perpendicular to a plane. Okay. So, but, but of course, we all grow up with vector calculus, linear algebra, and matrices. And, you know, then we have our research areas. And it's very difficult to actually to listen to somebody if they come along and say, I've got this super duper new mathematical system that you ought to, you yeah. know, take notice of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would okay. say, if someone comes up to me and says, look at this, you know, <laughs> I would say, well, you know, I've got my own research and it takes me all my time to, you know, okay. do what I'm doing. Okay. And so what planted the seed in you that you wanted to follow this path? Um. So you're the truth. You sure. sure. <laughs> that was the goal. Yeah. Okay. So the truth is, my husband um, met David Hester's Anthony um, Lazenby, he he became fairly obsessed with geometric algebra. He is a cosmologist. Uh -huh. He could see that there was this thing which told him what the Cauchy-Riemann equations are, if you, you know, for people who know it, um, that the Pauli matrices and the Dirac matrices in in space-time quantum physics were just you know, really interpretable. Hmm. Um, he became obsessed with it, totally obsessed. Um, so Anthony had a PhD student called Chris Doran. Chris and Anthony, they wrote, they've written a book on, on geometric algebra, geometric algebra, algebra for phys physicists. And it was very difficult for me to actually um, talk to my husband uh, at that point okay. without <laughs> actually finding out something about it. Okay. Because he thought it was one of the um, most exciting things he'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. And you were at the time just pursuing math, a PhD? What were you? I was pregnant at the time. Okay. So I was just about to have a baby. <laughs> okay. So I did have some time, actually. Yeah. Because I was, you know, not that much time, of course, when you've got a small child. Yeah. But yeah, I was in it. I was, in, I'd gone back as an engineer. I was a postdoc uh -huh. in engineering. I was doing imaging. I was imaging flames. Um, that was a, a, a two, two year postdoc position. But I actually then began to realize that these, this algebra, um, would be really useful in parts of engineering, particularly things which involved rotations hmm. and Maybe I should talk about rotations mm -hmm. because in engineering and physics, rotation, the way geometric algebra deals with rotations is totally key. So have you heard of quaternions? I've heard of them, yeah. So quaternions are, well, if we go back, people rotate with rotation matrices. So yeah. you have, say in three, by, in three dimensions, you have a three by three matrix, you act on a vector and it rotates it. Now, a rotation has just three degrees of freedom. We have nine, nine components in a three by three matrix, mm -hmm. and so they're all constrained. So rotation matrices are not numerically nice to deal with because you have to keep them on the manifold. You have to make, make sure if you change, if you update rotation matrices, you have to make sure it, it, it um, uh, obeys the constraints. Okay. So, so that's one of the things we use. Now, in graphics, et cetera, and satellite motion, it's long been known that the best things to use is quaternions. Other methods are Euler angles, like okay. a, a rotation about the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis. Uh -huh. But quaternions have been particularly nice because they are um, minimally parameterized. They have three components. They are smooth. They don't suffer from singularity problems and Hamilton um, created quaternions as an extension of complex numbers. So complex numbers, everybody, people know that the complex number I, if mm -hmm. you, I effectively rotates in the plane, a multiplication by I. So Hamilton spent many, many years in his later life ex trying to extend complex numbers to three dimensions, mm -hmm. and it came up with quaternions. So quaternions have these elements, i, j, k, which all square to minus one. 
So it has like three mm -hmm. um, imaginaries. So now, to start with, that's pretty awful. And but everybody knew they were great. Great. So there's libraries. People have been using Quaternion since the since the early days of satellites. Okay. So if you actually look at code, etc., you know, people will use this for rotations. Now, very early on, it, you know, it's in David's book that you see that if I if I square one of these bivectors in 3D, let's stick in 3D for now. Um, if I square it, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a unit by that, I get minus one. So I have a real object that squares to minus one. Okay. Which is kind of telling me that I, the, complex, the unit imaginary, and this JK are probably unit planes. And it turns out that the quaternions are just rotations. The IJK give you rotations about the unit planes in three dimensions, the mm -hmm. X, Y, the Y, Z, and the X, Z plane. Mm -hmm. So immediately you see that, you can have complete generalizations of things that do rotations in any dimension. And so at that point, you're doing this postdoc position yes. and you realize that you could apply it. Yes. Not to flames, but to, no, okay. to mainly computer vision. Okay. And yeah. what, what was the stage, like the state of computer vision at this time? What year was this? 93, 1993. Okay. So, so not much so, happening. Yeah, but a lot of the, you know, it was, it was um, really starting to move forward. There was no machine learning in computer vision, no. that, but it was all geometry. Right. It was basically okay. all geometry. So people had used project, well, you know, people had been using the ideas of projective geometry in computer vision for a long time, which is a four-dimensional okay. space. Um, still with matrices. So I rotate and translate things. So I have lots of cameras. I want to find from my images the rotations and translations between my cameras. Mm -hmm. Once I've done that, I can triangulate and I can do 3D reconstruction. Okay. There was also at that stage a lot of... <clears throat> Bayesian statistics were coming into computer vision, so tracking things in op in images yeah. and finding most probable the most probable tracks in right. in um, you know crowds. Okay, like that. so computer vision was really starting to take off. Okay, and so you you're you finish up your two year, you're creating these flames, these graphics essentially. Yeah. Uh, what do you jump into to actually give it a go? So I was extremely lucky because that by that point I had two small children. Um, I I don't know if you heard the Royal Society. No. In what well, the Royal Society, um, the body in London. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you probably you probably have because it's it has. Um, journals and lots of, you know, historical people with big names in history um, sure, yeah. were fellows of the Royal Society. So the Royal Society has something called University Research Fellows. And I applied to do, it was probably quite a step for them because I, I applied to do applications of geometric algebra in engineering. And they gave it to me. No. So I then had a five-year <laughs> effectively postdoc and I could choose what teaching I did. And the engineering department were very good. You know, I, I didn't didn't need to do a lot of teaching or admin, but I basically had um, kind of five years to try and get this off the ground. To kind of figure it out. And what yeah. yeah, what was an example of an early project? So um so an early project was uh, actually with um I, I I I think at the time. I mean, the internet wasn't really like it, right, quite course. like it was yeah. today. Um, but there was a, some mailing lists and there was a, um, somebody who called Eduardo Bairo Corachano, who's now in Mexico. But he put this email out on some lists saying, anybody working with computer vision and geometric algebra? I thought, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so well, I actually, you know, contacted him and... <clears throat> Those early days, we we did quite a lot of translating all the classic projective geometry computer vision, mm -hmm. which was quite mathematical at the time, um, into geometric algebra. Gotcha. Okay. And 
I mean, this may sound kind of basic, but <clears throat> one of the really nice things about putting putting your problem, etc., into geometric algebra is you have an origin, right? In, in, so some inertial frame. Everything is with respect to that. Mm -hmm. So I rotate, translate that. Right. I don't have matrices, so I don't have to worry about coordinate systems. I don't stack up coordinate system upon coordinate system and then worry about what on earth that translation yeah, vector, relates, yeah. what, can, what coordinate system is that in? Yeah. And with vision, where you're measuring things in an image, uh -huh. can, and that is, so what coordinate frame is that in? Yeah. You know, it's, it is quite, quite confusing. And I know this for a fact because students are very confused about it all. <laughs> when you've got a rotation, where is it with respect to in these complicated systems, etc.? This just makes life very, very easy. Okay. And you... You almost can't go wrong. And was the goal of this five-year period to then apply it to some like uh, product use, or just do the basic research and see how it goes? What what, yes. what happened at that time? Uh, it was um, just really seeing what we could get out of it. Okay. So I did some work with a company called Phase Space, who's a mo they're a motion capture company in the states, <clears throat> not far from Berkeley, and you know looking at algorithms to calibrate cameras mm -hmm. because one of the things i haven't mentioned is um that there is another aspect to this system which is extremely useful so i've said that i have these geometric objects my rotations are objects mm -hmm. so i can write down coordinate free expressions but not only can i write them down i can differentiate with respect to them easily okay so because i have this algebra of objects yeah I can do calculus on them. Okay. And that's quite hard to do conventionally because you've got people can do it, but you know, you're differentiating with respect to a matrix or a tensor or a vector and all this. So it's a much harder um you can do it component wise, mm -hmm. but if I want to get closed form solutions, mm -hmm. um doing kind of the analytic stage of the calculus is extremely useful. Hmm. And so the the notion was that you could do it with less compute, like you could render these things using geometric algebra no. faster? No. Never. Okay. <laughs> but, but So you can do it pretty fast. It's more, uh, it's much easier to program up. Okay. It's intuitive. You can think of what you want to do. And I can program it up at kind of this high level. Yeah. Underlying... You've got an algebra of a much bigger algebra than three dimensional space where I've got right, three vectors. Course. So actually, computationally, there's more going on. There's more going on. Okay. Yeah, but at a higher level, you know, I can I can get code to do all this for me. And at a higher level, yeah, I can certainly write rotate this object to this object. Okay. Etc. And then in terms of the, like the state of computer vision from then until now, what has progressed to make this this drone project possible? Okay, so. This is an interesting question. Um, so David Hessness and Garrett Sopcik uh, wrote a book. Um, this is a sort of um, real reference book of Clifford Algebra to Geometric Calculus. Yeah. It's got everything in there. It's not a book you'd read. It's a book, it's a book that you go to it's find It's like a out. reference. It's a yeah. reference book. Yeah. I'm sure they meant it for you to read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that was 1984 or so. Um, in... 1999, David gave a talk at a conference. Uh, he'd done a paper with Hongbo Lee about something which was in the final few pages of this book. Hmm. Of course, not many of us had ever got to the final few pages of this book, which he called Conformal Geometric Algebra. So this is truly stunning for graphics and for vision-y mm -hmm. projects, projects which use vision. So... Conformal geometric alge algebra is a five-dimensional space. So imagine you take Euclidean space, the space we live in, you effectively add on two more vectors. One is the origin, and one is a point at infinity. Projective geometry effectively adds on one more vector. So this is this five-dimensional space. So you get um, this five space and you think, well, okay, what you know? What is this going to get me? <laughs> well, what this gets you is that points, lines, planes, circles, and spheres become objects in the algebra. They're objects. You give me a, mm -hmm. a 
C, this big C is a circle. Mm. It's, it's a trivector in my five-dimensional space. And rotors, which are these this class of objects that rotate, encompass rotations, translations, dilations, and in the... Uh, no, Rotations, translations, dilations. So you've suddenly got, I I can, for, for example, set up. You mm -hmm. give me three points. Mm -hmm. I immediately get the circle that joint, that curve passes through. You give me four points. I give you the sphere. It's an object. I use my rotor. I rotate it. I intersect them. It's a, it's a beautiful language for graphics. Mm, okay. So, but because... And a lot, a lot from 1999, lots of people, well, a fair number of Relative people. Relative, yeah. Um, Leo Dorst and Stephen Mann and Daniel Fontaine um, in Steve in Canada, um, Leo et al. in Amsterdam, um, wrote a book, Geometric Algebra of Computer Scientists. And a lot of that was based on this conformal, just what you could do, yeah. you know, just how easy it was to do things. So um, because... Lines are just objects. Because I know how to sort of compare one line to another, uh, because I can intersect lines and planes, keeping this nice algebra, mm -hmm. um, you know, it becomes quite almost easy to see what I have to do to implement a variety of algorithms. So you've, I mean, it's quite hard to intersect two spheres. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people can do it, but in well, it's classic, easy to imagine how it works. But yeah, for yeah, yeah. But you know, you've got equations. But here, we just do have operators that do it. We're between objects, mm -hmm. and one of the beautiful things is, and we live in a Euclidean, well, to all <laughs> extents and purposes. Yeah. You know, from what we see, it's yeah. Euclidean. Now, if you have a different underlying geometry, yeah. So if you have um, hyperbolic or spherical geometry. Mm -hmm. Uh, then in this algebra, you have to change you ha in conformal algebra. Euclidean geometry is the thing that keeps the point at infinity invariant. Then if I keep other things invariant, I get these other geometries. Okay. And I can just use my standard apparatus and do exactly the same things. Rotates, rotate my objects in um, hyperbolic space and rotate my objects in spherical space, move them around. Okay. So it is uh, it's a beautiful language mm -hmm. for geometry. Okay. And I haven't even touched on physics because a lot of, you know, um, de Sitter space, which okay. a lot of the cosmologists work in, is a different geometry. Okay, gotcha. Which you couldn't use this for. Right, well, which is why it was appealing to your husband 30 years ago. No. So, exactly. Yeah. So he, you know, he started out by being amazed at how um, things like Pauli and the Dirac matrices, spinners were all just trivial in this algebra. And then he started to realize um, that these complicated transformations, tense, which are all mm -hmm. written in tensor notation, are actually, if you put them in geometric algebra, they are mappings between real things like bivectors to bivectors mm -hmm. or bivectors to vectors and things like this. And as soon as you see it in this way, it be enables you to sort of, you know, interpret things and then maybe move move on. Oh, okay. And um, so, for example, um, so Anthony and Steve Gall, Chris Doran and David Hessen are interested in, in a theory of gravity in flat space, which produces all... So, you know, their theory of gravity, you could understand. <laughs> okay. If you understood the algebra. Yeah. Basically. Okay, <clears throat> gotcha. Um, and so, the as you were saying before, like the reason why people aren't picking up geometric algebra is that you become kind of in a certain track and then you know what you know. Yeah. But, but right now, what are people using for modern computer vision to do comparable work? <clears throat> Um, so, computer vision is um, m really massively advanced. You know? Of course, yeah. Um, so, uh, today, so people are really now moving from geometry to um, machine learning. 
you know, so you use uh, using a little bit of geometry, but you are learning to segment things, recognize things by giving it lots and lots of images. But, you know, you still have, you, we still have lots of geometric problems. Mm -hmm. So we still have to extract things from images if we've got moving cameras yeah. and things like that. But we have, I suppose it's a case of geometric algebra won't really give you anything that you can't do conventionally. Mm -hmm. But what it might enable you to do is to see how, how, to do that thing. So, for example, if mm -hmm. I ask you how close is one line to another, mm -hmm. I have a way of doing that in my algebra. Mm -hmm. If I could, I could sit down and write it in conventional. Oh, of course. Yeah. So, but but could I have actually thought of that conventionally? Uh, probably not. Okay. Because I'm not clever enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, you know, I, okay. I, need, I need a set of tools which makes sense to me geometrically and physically and i can then th think oh, me and uh, you know other people can of course, yeah. think about how to extend that okay and so in in your day-to-day -day research how are you then applying machine learning because yet many of your your phd students are working on exactly that okay right? so yeah. um it's it's almost impossible n to avoid machine learning yeah <laughs> no you can try yeah. but you yeah. can't avoid it so i have i have two um a sort of strands. So some students are applying conventional machine learning techniques. Uh -huh. Well, conventional, you know, they, they change all the time. Neural networks, um, recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, to classical data like um, medical time series data. And I, I, I don't know how you can use geometric algebra for that. Right. Okay. So, um, and, you know, doing image segmentation, et cetera. So mm -hmm. classical image segmentation, well, you know, um, I'm not sure how you can get geometric algebra into that. But mm -hmm. as soon as it comes to anything involving like a moving camera, moving drone, multiple moving cameras, having streams of images, mm -hmm. you want to match things, you want to triangulate, mm -hmm. et cetera. Then it is almost the only way I know how to do it. Okay. Now. Gotcha. So, so it's that aspect of it, and then can we extend it? So, can we then, you know, we know how how to parameterize in this algebra on my lines, my planes, etc. Can I learn them? Hmm. So, can I learn these geometric objects? So, are we we're keen on analyzing both sort of moving images, which we we're going to extract lines, planes, and also motion. Mm -hmm. So motion, can I actually parameterize my problem in terms of my geometric objects and learn them? Mm, okay. And so for instance, like, you know, someone doing computer vision with a self-driving car, like, are they applying the same techniques that you're applying to get these lines or what would they use? I think, um, no. So, so, uh, so, you know, there's huge amounts of research yeah, yeah, self -driving of course. Cars yeah. and who knows what they're doing um but primarily it's um people are using if it's not like if it's not lidar right yeah. you know it's single camera multiple camera uh, lots of data yeah. bayesian methods for segmentation following lines is easy you know it's not that's not matching them or trying to reconstruct them you're just kind of following them it's really recognizing um, if it's a person, if it's a road, if it's a tree, and and you've got multiple sensors, so you know exactly where you are. GPS is right is really accurate these days. Um, so no, no is the answer. Yeah, I think I but I don't know. Well, I mean, so the the question I'm kind of getting around to is like where are the other applications, right? So like you in, in your instance, like you're rotating in a camera, you want to map something, makes a lot of sense, like, and then you can move it around with, because you have the lines, you can recreate the yeah. shape. Um, what are the other use cases? Well, you know, I do think that its real use is this, the fact that it unifies, it's a unifying language. So if I know this, I can just work things out more easily. Instead mm -hmm. of trying, I mean... If people have worked with computer vision, they will know that often things don't work. So instead of a rotation matrix R, they try R transpose. And instead of a translation vector T, they try 
or transpose T. And they mess around till it works because it's <laughs> kind of confusing. Okay. Um, you've got no such problem here. It's very straightforward. Now, okay, that's not, that's not a, a good reason to use it if you're proficient enough with classical techniques. But I, I can go into fields like thin shell elasticity. You know, and um, there is a student who uh, is here at the moment doing this. That is quite an involved field. But if hmm. we put it in terms of, like, I have these rotors, I have a surface, I can stretch them, I can translate them, then it's just in the language of computer vision. It's not okay. in differential geometry. It's not in anything else. It's it's a totally understandable um, uh, process. Right. Okay. So you could you could see a world where then you know uh, an artificial intelligence understands this and then can apply it anywhere and then you can then understand it. I yeah yeah I think that's okay. where its strength lies. Yeah. And in and in new physics, oh, I I okay. think I think you know that because it unifies lots of hmm. different um, quantum mechanics and relativity and you know it hasn't it's not. It's not unifying quantum gravity yet, yet, but yeah. you can see that it's a, it is a, a system whereby you might be able to think of different ways forward. Right. Okay. So it's actually a better tool. It's a better tool. In many it's a better tool. <laughs> okay. Because people are extremely clever. So they will find ways of doing things mm. that are stunningly clever, hmm. but um, are complicated. Right. And, and so sophisticated. where do you see limits right now? I think it's, I, I don't think it's, it's not computational anymore because we're building up more and more tools. So I yeah. can, I can give you a, a website and, you know, you can try it out yeah. and you won't have to install anything because it's an online, you know, yeah. Python notebook. So you can, you can have a, a play with it. So we are, you know, we are a community, which is certainly moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, there still isn't, there aren't a lot of us. Um, so it's not taught. It's not taught. So, you know, I teach my fourth year's image processing, <laughs> but I don't teach them geometric algebra. Okay. And are, are, is there an interest there to learn or they're just like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, when you don't know about it, you, you can't really be interested in it. Okay. So it's a, it's a, and Students have no hang-ups. They learn it and they think, great, you know, it's another tool. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And use it. Okay. Hmm. So um, it really, it enables you. I mean, I have a lot of confidence that if you give me a paper on uh, um, shell elasticity, it's going to be tough because there's tensors everywhere and I've got frames and frames and frames and dual frames and things, but I can eventually understand it. Mm -hmm. um, so these different fields, if I, there's a colleague, Alan McRoby, who's using a sort of form of it in structures. Mm. So there are fields. Electromagnetism is also, uh, I, should have, I should have mentioned this, is a field whereby you really get huge simplification. So I am fairly confident I can model um, electromagnetic fields and do maybe some new engineering hmm. things using this, if I had time. Okay. Well, that, I was we were talking about programming before we started recording at lunch yeah. and about uh, going from MATLAB to Python, yeah. right? Have people tried to create a port? In other words, like, oh, you have this traditional equation, we can port it over, and then you can understand it and see the value. Has that happened yet? Um, no. Okay. Not really. Not really. I mean, there are... I mean, most of the code is um, enabling you to do things in a kind of transparent way, like I can wedge together two vectors, or yeah, I can multiply kind of two vectors together. Well. Yeah. I can conformal, I can for my sphere and visualize it. Yeah. And I can do numerical, I can do lots of numerical computations with it fast. Yeah. So we can now do it quickly. But porting things is a kind of difficult one. Yeah, like you're saying, well, you know, here's my equations in terms of Pauli spinners. Um, what does it look like in geometric algebra? 
well, kind of looks the same, except your spinners aren't spinners. They're, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it's a difficult, that, that's a very hard yeah. um, question to answer. Right, because it's not so simple as like, oh, this is how you call this yeah. function. It's not the same no, thing really. at all. Right. No. Okay. So this is sort of a weird random tangent, but before when we met, you were telling me that a couple of years ago, someone posted on Hacker News one of your papers. Yeah. What was it? What was it about? How did all this happen? So it was, it was an invited paper, um, in the Millennium Edition, so it was 2000, of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So we, we wrote a paper which was um, telling, just saying how geometric algebra was a unifying language and look at all these great things we can do in computer science, engineering and physics. Yeah. And this is the way the world works and um, this is, you know, you should, you should yeah. do it. So it, it you know, some <laughs> citations and it sat there until um, bizarrely um, it was posted there yeah. and it was some, a friend of mine um, who reads these things texted me and said, well, your paper is number one read <laughs> on this Hacker News. And I said, well, what's that? You know, is that yeah. good or is that bad? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so hard to know how it, how it emerged and hard to know how many, I mean, were there some people who looked at that and now are in our geometric algebra community who, right. you know, started to get interested and came along? Um because um, throughout the world now, there are groups and, you know, in the 19, 1990, there were not many. Yeah. There were little groups who were really keen on it. Um, but now there are groups you know, almost everywhere. They're not big. Sure. But. Um, Interesting. Did you, did you read the comments when, um, when it went up there? I did. Yeah. I mean, they range from, wow, this looks really cool, uh, to this looks crazy, you know, uh, yeah. and impossible to understand. We, you know, I thought, oh, no, that doesn't, you know, that wasn't the... Oh, we're not trying to communicate that. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, we didn't want to say that. <laughs> to, gosh, this looks as though it can do everything, you know. So it, right. they, weren't, they weren't very detailed. It was okay. more people beaming in and saying, um, do we short things? Although, I don't know whether I read them all. Uh, that's the nature of the internet. You have to comment quickly. The yeah, post just falls off the front page yeah. and then your comments Because, are good. of course, yeah, in the next five hours, it was probably yeah. uh, gone. Right, exactly. Sunk down to 100. Right. But <laughs> but um, what, what do the folks who are, are there naysayers? Is that a community? Sorry, what? Are there naysayers of geometric algebra? Uh, like like, oh, this thing sorry. is not going to be a thing. Yeah. Um, um, I, I wouldn't say say so i mean there are people who yeah. there are lots of people who think yeah that looks interesting but really i can do it anyway you yeah. know and i have i am i am the world's expert in you know Pauli matrices or whatever sure. yep. why do i need to put my matrix in terms of a vector um and so you know people think in different ways um to them that is the way of doing it that's always been the way of doing it um so I don't think there are people who say, oh, this is complete rubbish. There mm -hmm. are just people who say, well, yeah, but, you know, what's it going to get me? Okay. Um, and I don't think people, it's not the kind of thing where you could say it's wrong because it's not wrong. Right. It's just a, a tool which, yeah. you know, depends whether you want to invest the time because you think about multiplying vectors together and, and things like this. Yeah. It's it's anti-commutative. It's not a commutative algebra. So immediately you throw away everything you've learned mm -hmm. as a kid and through school and through university. So it it makes perfect sense once you're into it. Mm -hmm. But there's a little, you gotcha. know, there's a little hump. That there's a learning have, curve, yeah. There's a learning curve. You have curve. to throw some things away. Yeah. yeah. And it's much easier for younger people to do that. Sure. That makes sense. Because they have no real prejudices. Right. Okay. They, they say, yeah, it's another another thing, you know. It's like machine learning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> another algorithm. I'll program it up now. You know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, I don't... I think probably there are people who, who do think, well, why should I bother? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they would say, no, it's a wrong thing to do. You know, one shouldn't do that. One should use matrices. And Okay. So it, in your, you know, educated opinion, 
where do you see this really taking hold in the next, I don't know, like for thinking about it in the, in the practical sense. Um, so many people who are listening to YC podcasts are like entrepreneurs or engineers are studying. Um, where do you see the people applying things like this? Um, so um, clearly in the, f- in the fields of um, fundamental theoretical advances. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like physics... Um, or at the aspects of physics that we're not quite sure about. Yeah. That's the big, yeah. um, that's I th- where I see it will have some effect um, because it enables you to think and it enables you to think in different ways. Um, in engineering, I think there are lots of fields and I don't know whether the, is there a killer application where if I could do it, everyone would say, whoa, this is the way to go. Right. I don't know. Um as I say, I, I, I would, what I would like to see is that people, people had it in their toolbox. Yeah. Because, um, you know, there are lots of very, very clever people around who can cope with very hard, mm-hmm. sophisticated physics and maths. There are a lot of people who are maybe not quite so clever and they need the right tools in order to do these complex things. And I see it as actually this provides these people with a real, you know, a lot of people have a lot of geometric insight, but maybe not the mathematical sophistication. Mm, And I think mm -hmm. this would certainly sort of give them um, a big advantage um, because it seems to me to be the way the world works. This, if it's a unifying language, it's what we should be writing our equations in. Okay. Um. So I'm not yeah. sure that's answered your question. Yeah, no, that's but. a great, that's actually a great answer. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. And I, I like it a lot too. Um, if you weren't working on this, do you have thoughts on where you might apply your, your energy? Well, it's interesting because I have always had, I'm, I'm a runner. Mm-hmm. So I've been a runner since I was a kid. I, I am absolutely convinced that even if you don't run you know as you get older you need to move and you need to keep your body moving independently you need to make the muscles move independently you need to keep healthy and I I probably would be doing something which tried to get everybody out and oh. moving and isn't that that was not what you were expecting no it's it? great yeah. yeah but you know I look at people and as they get older and life could be so much better for them if they kept mobile and they, they looked after their body. A slight obsession of mine, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's totally awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess then my last question is uh, if someone wants to learn more about this and actually start trying it out, yeah. uh, where should they go? Well, so lots of, books available and i i pr- people will probably be annoyed with me if i don't <laughs> mention their books <laughs> okay. but the so the the david heston has three books space time algebra probably not the place to start new foundations of classical mechanics and geometric algebra um clifford algebra to geometric calculus now they they're great books um, my husband anthony and chris doran have a book geometric algebra physicists Leo Dorr, Stephen Mann, and um, Daniel Fontaine have a book which is Geometric Algebra for Computer Scientists. Eduardo Barraconichano has books which are uh, more focused on robotics. Mm-hmm. So there are lots of books out there, lots of review articles, lots of conference proceedings, lots of code now. So people, you can kind of get code for yeah. MATLAB, for C, for... Um, Python. We've been using now a, pa- a package by an American guy called Alex Arsenovich, who wrote a Clifford package, and we've been integrating it into um, a no- a, my, one of my students, Hugo, who you met, yep. um, has created a 
a web version. So the big problem with a lot of these things, you have to download the package. You've got the package. You've got to get the NumPy. You've got to get, you've got to get all these other things. You've got to get it all working. You've got to get it working. Yeah. And if you're on Linux, this tends to be not too bad. If you're on Windows, it's like impossible. Yeah. Um, not impossible. But your average person would probably say, you know what? No. Yeah. But we, we're working to try and get a, a web version so people can actually go on, hmm. just try it out with some readme files and, and a bit of graphics so you can see it. So there's loads of stuff out there at the moment. Where can they find that if they want to? Maybe on, is it on your site or? Um, it is Hugo. So Hugo and Alex have been working on this and I can give you the web address. Okay, we can put it in the blog post. Yeah, yeah. Because ju they're just re releasing it to the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. All so right. it'd be good to have people te test it out and yeah. say, email back and say, this doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Been a pleasure.